Thank you very much, Stefan, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, for the very kind uh, opportunity to uh, give a tutorial here at the uh, Web Science Summer School. I'm excited to be here. Uh, my name is Markus Stromeyer. I'll give this tutorial together with Claudia Wagner. And the tutorial that we'll give is essentially uh, a similar tutorial that we gave at the World Wide Web Conference um, a couple of months ago uh, in Montreal this year. This was a joint effort. Uh, this tutorial was not only held by us. Uh, today it's just us, but uh, the people that were involved are Inma Weber from the uh, Qatar Computing Research Institute and uh, Luca Maria Aiello, uh, who used to be at Young Labs and I think now is at uh, Bell uh, Cambridge Labs. So it's us uh, today. I'll give the first half and uh, Claudia will give the second half. Steffen already said uh, all of that. I'm a computer scientist who works in a social science institute. That's essentially uh, the one line description of my interest. So I'm interested in applying computational methods to study social phenomena. Mostly on the web, but not only. Who are you? Uh, can I just ask by a quick show of hands what your disciplinary background is? How many of you have a computer science background? How many of you have a social science background? And how many of you have another background? <laughs> Can I ask what it is? Music. Oh, so, yeah. What is your background? Psychology. 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 Excellent. And I think that's that's a great sort of uh, configuration of people for a web science summer school because, as you've probably heard during the week, the ambition of web science is multidisciplinarity. Right. Um, what I want to uh, walk you through, so this is just some context. Um, what I'm going to walk you through uh, today is a couple of uh, theories and methods that one can apply when one is interested in social science uh, questions and studying them through computational methods on the web. You, you now have, have heard sort of a week of lectures on web science. And I'm, I guess you are now well prepared to answer the question what a web scientist does. Maybe by examples or maybe by general answers. But I would be interested in sort of hearing your answers to that question. What does a web scientist do? They, they analyze enormous amounts of data that is being spread over the web to make sense and uh, extract some information and value out of this data to be used in commercial businesses and that's Reasonable? Any other answers? What does a web scientist do? Yeah? Research how the web, how the web influences society. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, answers to this question? Those are re reasonable answers, I guess. Uh, if I ask a slightly different question, why? Should web scientists do what they do? What would be your answer there? I'll try to give a couple of examples of why I think the world needs web scientists. Uh, but I'd like to hear your answers first. Maybe because they have a free time? Maybe what? <laughs> because they have a free time? They have free time. So to And they want to yeah. model maybe the society in order to predict something in the future or help somehow. Okay. Uh, why? Yeah. Uh, maybe over here? Uh, maybe they want to understand some phenomena. Okay. Knowledge? Yeah. The web can be used for good as well as bad. So okay. Uh, Political action? Yeah, because the, the web itself changes society and then you understand mm -hmm. how it's actually changing them. Okay. Yeah. Because they have simply this great resource that's growing everly. It's like all the people these days use the internet and that's a massive resource that should that should use and work on. Relevance, right? Everybody yeah. uses the web? Yeah. Uh, because everything is connected, we can't locate in one discipline. Okay. Yeah. I think those are all good answers. Um, I want to give a, a couple of additional answers of why I think uh, 
Web science is not also something that we should do out of interest, but that is sort of a, an obligation. And I will uh, try to give a couple of examples why we think, why I think that is. And before I do that, I want to start off with uh, sort of a basic idea or concept in social science, which is the idea of uh, found data, or sometimes also called uh, process data or organic data. How do, how do social sciences operate uh, usually? Uh, or what is sort of a standard way of answering the social science question. One standard way is asking a random sample of people, uh, fielding surveys, trying to understand uh, what are reasons for certain uh, societal issues or problems that we are interested in, then analyzing the answers and trying to answer the question. An alternative approach to that in the social sciences, an approach that is much less um, explored than for example, traditional survey-based methods, is research based on found data. And the idea of found data is, let's not ask people what they think uh, the situation is. Let's look at their behavior, and let's look at uh, maybe traces that they leave in their environment in order to learn something about their behavior. So, one example of this idea is, let's ask via a survey 100 university students how much alcohol they consume, right? And you will get a distribution of answers. Maybe one beer a day, maybe two beers a week, whatever it is. And you can think of an alternative approach, which is look at the trash bins at the university campus, right? And let's count the number of beer bottles that we see in the trash bins. We would probably not get the same answer, right? And why is that? What what, is, what are reasons why we would not get it? We have a single student who consumes 10 bottles of beer. For example. And we have a concept of fun here. So of what? Fun. Fun? Yeah. For the market. We? You have to pick it again. So you give it again back to the pocket. You don't go away. The point is that students lie. Yeah. Right? That's another issue. Right? If you ask somebody whether he's an alcoholic, he might have a bias. To say that he isn't, I don't know. Uh, so there are problems with survey-based methods, but there are also problems based with found data, right? For example, if there is a return bottle policy on campus, then you might not find much beer bottles in the trash bin. So those are different ways of looking at, at problems. And there are other examples, like, uh, for example, one of the early examples of found data is museums who have installed floor tiles that are particularly abrasive. So when people walk across these floor tiles, they would damage the floor tiles, right? You would see where they went based on the damage they caused. And the idea is if you install such floor tiles into a museum and let the exhibition run for a couple of weeks, and then you inspect the, the damage on the floor tiles, you would have an idea of, for example, what objects in the exhibition have attracted uh, the most people standing in front of the object. That would be a way of exploring um, how people move through uh, certain spaces. The same thing, if you think about it, is uh, can be observed on the web. So uh, this is a very prominent example of uh, using uh, trace data to learn something about uh, social phenomena. What we see here is the political blogosphere around the time of the US presidential election in 2004. Each dot is a blog, each link is a reference from one blog to another blog. Technically, this is done by trackbacks, if you are familiar with the terminology. A note is red if it's a Republican, a note is blue if it's a Democrat. And what we see here is the application of a network visualization algorithm that immediately shows very conveniently that it seems that there is some kind of polarization going on in the conversations around this election. Right? It seems like uh, blue blocks link more to each other than they link to red blocks and the other way around. So a phenomenon that we know from society like polarization seems to have a correspondence on the web in the blogosphere. It seems like we find a phenomenon that we know exists offline also in the online. And that's interesting, right? As a web scientist, 
uh, I, I would say is, is one reason to look at the web because it seems like social issues spill over uh, from the offline to the online. This is another example. It's a very similar study that we did uh, 10 years after this study with uh, the German national elections uh, in 2013, uh, which uh, was interesting in two regards, I think. One, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting because it's a multi-party system and not a two-party system, and we still see homophily. And the second aspect is, this was not blogs, but Twitter, and politicians who are active on Twitter. And even if we uh, look at a different system, we still see a similar thing. Okay. And Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the inventor of the web, of course, is aware of the fact that the web is a sort of a very uh, conducive environment for social phenomena and social and uh, there is this idea of the webindex.org. I don't know how many of you have heard about the web, web index, okay. which is an initiative to track uh, social issues on the web. So examples of that are, for example, uh, the web in its relation to economic inequality, or the web and gender inequality, web and social inequality. And the web index is more or less a project that has the idea of tracking these issues on the web over time. And to take uh, Tim Berners-Lee's own words, what he says about the web is that the web has the potential to be a great equalizer, but only if we hardwire the rights to privacy, freedom of expression, affordable access, and net neutrality into the rules of the game. So the core idea is, I'm rephrasing here, that the web is this sort of fundamental force for good that provides everybody equal access to information, knowledge, and opportunity, right? That would be wonderful. And I think that was what has driven uh, many of the people who have worked on web, on the web, on the web technologies. That once we have established the web, humanity would be better off. That all of us would have, so we would make sure that every child that is born into this world would have the equal rights uh, and, and uh, opportunities afforded to them, independent of, uh, you know, the country that they grow up in. So, because the web allows to access, for example, an online course uh, at MIT, right? That's the idea. <coughs> so that's the promise. Uh, and let, let's now look at the state of the web and assess to what extent you think this promise has been achieved. So for, let's take one example, uh, Google Image Search. And let's search for doctor on Google English search. And those are the top results that I've gotten at the time when, uh, when I looked for a doctor on Google English. Is there anything that pops to the front of your mind when you see this result? On mostly men. Mostly men, exactly. There are two women in there, right? Yeah. <coughs> That's right, yeah. No scientists. That's, that's a good point, yeah. They were all white. Yes. Right. So lots of biases and stereotypes are encoded in what we see when we search for certain channels. Let's, im let's imagine you have a young daughter who is, let's say, maybe. 10, 12, 13, and she starts thinking about what to do with her life, right? And she types in doctor into Google image search in order to explore what a doctor's world looks like. That's the image that would be projected, right? And it will tell your daughter probably that is not the right job for her, right? Because if you want to be a doctor, at least that's what Google image search tells you, most of them are men. Ah, then you might think, maybe I want to be a nurse, right? Uh, let's type in nurse. And there are men in those results, but they are even more hidden than the women in the doctor uh, query. So it seems like, and this, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, this has been studied in a paper that was published at CHI in 2015, where they looked at different professions and different uh, search queries. Uh, and what they found is that certain stereotypes 
can be uh, or are reflected in Google image searches. That doesn't seem to be the idea of uh, equal access uh, to opportunity, knowledge, and information, right? Not quite what we dreamed of when we thought of this uh, maybe utopian idea of them. What they found in this paper was evidence for stereotype exaggeration and systematic underrepresentation. Let's lose another uh, use another example. How many, how many of you know Airbnb? Okay, why not? Uh, a paper at, uh, published at Harvard looked at discrimination in Airbnb. Is it true that hosts on Airbnb discriminate based on ethnicity? Right? And you can study that on Airbnb. There is data to look at that. You can even do experiments, right? You can create the profile of a person, use a uh, picture of a black person and a white person, and for example, field 100 requests and count how many of them are accepted and how many are not. What this paper found was um, they didn't do these experiments in this paper, although you could. Um, what they did in this paper was they looked at the host side, on, on sort of the provider side of the market. If you are a white person or a black person, who wants to offer their apartment, controlling for certain aspects like uh, location, rent characteristics, and quality. It turns out that if you're black, you get 12% less money for the apartment that you rent, which is comparable to an apartment that the white person has. That doesn't seem to be equal access to information, knowledge, and opportunity, right? It seems like the stereotypes and the, the uh, preconceived notions and uh, prejudices that people have in the offline world manifest in the online as well. Here's another example of algorithmic biases. Uh, Google Photos uh, launched an application that automatically tagged uh, people into categories. Like if there is an airplane in the image, uh, it tags the airplane as airplane. Uh, if there are cars in the image, it tags the image as cars. And then things happen that we have long agreed in our society that we don't want to happen, right? Uh, and uh, this occurs. It doesn't seem that this is the web that we've just discussed at the beginning. This is not the, the uh, utopian idea of the web as the great uh, equals. Here's another example. Uh, that's a study that we did at, uh, in, in my department at uh, Casey's um, ourselves. Uh, we looked at Wikipedia and we looked at the portrayal of women and men on Wikipedia. In particular, notable people. Those are people that have some historic uh, significance. And what we are interested in is whether there are systematic differences between how women are portrayed on Wikipedia and how men are portrayed on Wikipedia. And what we found is that there are stark differences. So one of the differences is that Women on Wikipedia tend to be more linked to men than vice versa. Another thing that we found was if the word divorce occurs in the article, in the biography, it is four times four more likely that the article is about a woman than it is about a man. If you assume that men and women divorce at the same rates, which is not necessarily the case. This is a highly peculiar reason, right? Yes? Uh, did you find anything about uh, conflict, the role of women during conflict? The role of your woman using conflict? During what what do you mean? During conflict, like for example, we have uh, rewards and go, just keep on going. We didn't look at the edit history. Uh, okay. That could be that maybe women are more controversial. I don't know. Uh, that is something that we could look at. That's not in this study. No. This is a study to be done, I think. Nobody has looked at it, to my knowledge. Um, here's another example. Uh, so, some of you might be aware that um, websites use a technique that is called, sometimes called as dynamic pricing, right? So, if you go to a website, the price might be determined at the second when you go to the website. And for that, some, and of course, websites use all kinds of information to make that determination, right? 
For example, uh, it has been found that if uh, you go to a hotel booking website using a, a MacBook, an Apple product, there is a tendency to be shown uh, pricier hotels than if you go with the Windows laptop. Um, what uh, colleagues did, um, and this is uh, reported in the paper that is mentioned here, is they looked at different uh, online booking websites like Priceline uh, and others, and what they found was evidence for price theory and even price discrimination, for example, based on uh, location, uh, on websites of retailers and drug sites. So it seems like idea of equal access to information, knowledge, products even, and opportunity doesn't seem to be the case, right? Algorithmic differences between people who want to buy the same product. If you are buying something, it doesn't mean, I, I just learned that, I'm, I'm not sure whether this number is correct, but it's like, was it 20 or 25% of the prices on Amazon change within a week? Uh, of, of 20, 20 or 25% of all the products prices changes within a week. That's astonishing. So, no utopian idea of the web. This is not the, I would say, not the web. Here's another example. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of that, but if you uh, go to a mapping service, like uh, Bing Maps or Google Maps or Apple Maps, they will use uh, the location uh, from which you request the service to tailor the service to your device. So, for example, if you go to, uh, if you request uh, the territory of China or the borders of any other country, what Google will present you is the worldview that is consistent with the political environment in which you live. So, if you look at uh, China's border, you will get one view from Europe and you will get another view uh, from within mainland China. And what the research, uh, these researchers did that are mentioned in this paper down below, which was presented at uh, the Dr. Duck conference in Montreal this year, was they accessed all the tiles that they can get from Google Maps and Bing Maps, so the entire map underlying uh, these services. They compared them automatically. When there was differences that could not be determined automatically, they sent it to a crowdsourcing task where they tried to see whether there is an actual difference or not and what the difference is. And then they mapped out all those differences that they could find from all the different places. What I didn't mention is, of course, they had programs in, in, at computers at all those different places in the world to request the same information. And then they looked at differences. And what they found was that China's territory was shown to be about 20% larger by pixel count when it was depicted on Google map, Maps localized for mainland Chinese consumption. So depending on where you are, your worldview uh, will be different if you use Maps sort of as a way to learn about Google. Interesting, right? Not equal access uh, to information knowledge. So why our community should care about social issues on the web, and I just tried to use a couple of examples that I was hoping convince you that there is not just, um, one of you maybe jokingly said, web science because we have uh, free time on our hands, right? And we want to maybe learn something about it. I would say, uh, of course, there's a good reason to uh, do science. Often, lots of insights have come from uh, this motivation. But I would even say, uh, if you care about the web, there is a moral obligation to do web science. If you care about these issues that I've just presented, there is a moral obligation to approach the web by the scientific method, to measure the extent of social issues that we see in the web, uh, to maybe model them to understand their causes, and then to engage in a societal process that helps us figure out how to deal with these issues. And those are just another couple of examples of social issues that we can observe. And the question for web scientists, I, I would say, are how do we describe these issues, how do we measure them, how do we shape them in a conversation with the larger society, with uh, legal uh, perspectives being involved, with sociological perspectives, psychological perspectives involved. 
That's the reason why web science, that's one of the reasons I would say, why web science has to be interdisciplinary. Because the answers to these, the answer to these questions cannot be provided by a single uh, discipline. Right? If it would be computer science, the answer would be we do it because we can. Right? A social scientist would have a completely different view. A legal scientist. So I've mentioned uh, these issues. So here's another example. Um, could it be that, so let's assume that algorithms on LinkedIn use user feedback in ranking people. On LinkedIn, you can buy uh, access to, uh, as an HR person, you can buy access in order to search candidates, right? If you want to hire a software engineer, you can go to LinkedIn, buy for a certain account, and search for candidates that would be able to fill your research. What if the LinkedIn algorithm has been trained based on user feedback in such a way that it's much more, um, I would say, um, beneficial to rank men higher than women? Because it turns out HR uh, companies who pay for LinkedIn tend to prefer, slightly tend to prefer, just slightly. But it leads the algorithm to slightly rank men higher. And this in turn leads future customers from LinkedIn to slightly prefer men even more. And we might sort of engage in a, in a spiral that ends in a situation that not only is something that we don't want as a society, but that also has already been declared illegal, right? It's illegal to discriminate against gender in hiring processes. That's, it's not even a discussion. This has been set uh, for quite a while. Uh, what the argument that I'm trying to make is we are not aware of the extent to which these sociological issues are prevalent on the web. I'm not famili familiar of a single study that, for example, looked at this issue of LinkedIn and whether there is. It's not an easy uh, phenomenon to study, uh, but that should not keep us from trying to, right? Uh, and trying to in her mind, the extent. Uh, but it's the case. I'm not saying it's the case. I'm just doing a, so a thought experiment that plausibly, I would say, argues that it could be the case. And if it's the case, we would have a problem. Okay. So let's take, go back to what Tim Berners Lee has said. He has uh, said that the web has the potential to be a great equalizer, but only, and then there comes the ifs. And I think I've shown you a couple of examples where there is a really strong need to, uh, uh, to engage. And of course, uh, the question is what kind of web do we want? Right? It's a, a normative question. What, what is the web that we want? We need to decide. It cannot be uh, the situation I think that we have right now, which is that uh, our, our social life is mediated by algorithms and we don't fully understand the effects of the algorithms and how they uh, shape social issues. And of course, my, my answer, uh, and I would say also his answer would be that it is you in this room who need to lead, to lead the way of how to deal with these issues, right? It's web scientists that look at the web uh, and study it and try to understand it, who will shape our knowledge of the web and who will thereby shape ways in which um, the future web evolves. Yes? Um, it comes to my mind that uh, that's a political question, maybe, because the political system re represents uh, people and their opinions and so it could be a, a possible approach that politicians could yeah, discuss what should happen in web. But I think and not only political, but also legal. Yeah, uh, that's one thing, of course. But I think it's very interesting that so basic to every human being is possible. You, you mentioned it. But I think it's also yeah, it's a perfect way. Or it's, it's a good way if it's not the politicians, but yeah, all people. Or, as many people as possible uh, agree about something. Right. And I mean, 
you are probably at the heart of this community who can contribute to discussing these issues, right? Because when we start discussing them, what we first need to have an understanding of the phenomenon. And the web science community, I would say, is uniquely prepared to tackle these because of its interdisciplinary set. I just will give another example, because you mentioned political systems. Um, the in the current situation, as a researcher, if you want, for example, to study discrimination on Airbnb, what you often have to do, or what researchers often have to do, is to violate the terms of service of these websites. Sometimes the terms of service actually prohibit to do this kind of uh, data collection that is required for doing that analysis. What one, of, what one colleague from the US has just did, together with the ACLU in the US, which is sort of a civil rights uh, movement, he just sued. Uh, I don't. I. I'm not sure who, who was the target of this lawsuit, but he just sued in order to really establish the right of scientists to study these issues. So it's not only political; it's legal. Um, it has to be sociological. Uh, it has to be psychological. It has to involve all the disciplines uh, that have a stake in this. Yes. If the answer of we is the web researchers, I don't know if I am able to say the discrimination of the web is good or is bad. Because looking at Airbnb, maybe it's good if you, your apartment is in Brooklyn or something like that. Because it prevents white people to go to a dangerous place. That's why I say uh, we, not just you. Uh, it no, needs to be the community of people who care about issues on the web. Yeah, and, uh, Interdisciplinary teams. Yeah, but the other thing is, maybe we can bias uh, and, or try to aggregate cross-cultural values. And the second is, if we are the core scientists that are trying to, to answer this question, maybe there are another bias because of Russia. And you should be transparent about that and, and you know, lay it all down on the table and then look at it from different angles and then a sort of societal process needs to start and think about what we want, normative process. How do we want, uh, is it okay for us that uh, the color of the skin on Airbnb plays a role? Yeah. That's, that's not something that a computer scientist can answer, for example. But I think web science and we, as a web science community, need to enumerate the alternatives and their consequences that exist there in order to inform those people that will uh, maybe build their decisions based on what we find, based on the options that we have. Last question. Is there a panel or a conference or yeah, people are meeting to discuss these uh, issues and yeah, to take care for the values, so exist an uh, institution or something like that? Well, I, I mean, at, an institute. at GASIS we have this Department of Computational Social Science that looks exactly at these issues. Um, there is the Web Science Conference, I'm certain you, you've heard about that, uh, which is very open to these issues. There is the International Conference of Computational Social Science, which is a gathering of an interdisciplinary group of people who care about these issues. There are sort of many events and communities, I would say, uh, that, that care. I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm trying to increase awareness of these issues to give you a better answer to the why question. Why should you do web science? And I think these are very uh, deep examples of why it's, it's not just, uh, let's pick web science or some other science, I would say there is an obligation for society to look at these issues. And I think the web science community is particularly prepared to make a contribution there. Okay. And then once we've sort of discussed a bit the motivation of the why, uh, then we can go back to the what. What should we do with social scientists? And I think things that are useful is are uh, to build measurement instruments, right? To measure the extent of social issues that we observe. To 
get a deeper understanding of social phenomena, potentially causality in social phenomena, to help devise policies or to advise people who devise policies to test and experiment with ideas on the web in order to explore alternatives, to engage in regulation and standardization. Those are all things, I think, where web scientists can help to tackle those important right questions. And of course, uh, Dean Berners-Lee uh, has been leading, uh, in many ways, the way towards these ideas. He, uh, has created this, uh, or the foundation has created uh, this idea of the web we want, where people can uh, engage, and that would probably also be an answer to your question, an institution that cares about these questions. Um, the title of the tutorial is Computational Social Science for the World Wide Web. I just want to give uh, one of many definitions of computational social science, which could be described as the science that investigates social phenomena through the medium of computing and algorithmic data processing. There has been a seminal uh, article in Science called Computational Social Science using this uh, example of blogosphere in the 2004 elections that argues more or less that there is sort of a drastic um, sort of potential upswing in the way social sciences are being conducted because of uh, the, the digital traces and the uh, digital representations of sociological phenomena that we can observe in the world. And there's a couple of initiatives worldwide, like uh, in Harvard, the Stanford Institute for Research in the Social Sciences. At CEU, there's an initiative at University of Massachusetts, I believe, there's a very strong initiative. There are many initiatives to tackle these issues. It's called computational social science, social science in the end. So one might be tempted to ask, so is this a new field for only social scientists to engage in? And I would, would strongly uh, argue against that. I would strongly say that these are interdisciplinary issues and the World Wide Web community and the web science community need to actively join this effort to shape the web we want. Why? Because you are uniquely positioned to think about these, uh, all these issues from different perspectives. You're going to have a, a network of people from different disciplines. I mean, some things that are probably um, given to you right now, which is a network of interdisciplinary people, is not given to researchers uh, in other contexts, right? Maybe 10 years ago. Uh, it's not that easy to identify researchers from other disciplines that share a similar interest. Uh, you have people from music here, right? Uh, but you might be interested as a computer scientist to, in uh, to uh, investigate the phenomenon on the intersection between music and um, computational methods. Uh, and you could, there's an easy way to reach out because you're all in the same room. I think that's the benefit of the web science community, that it continuously tries to let different disciplines and different perspectives collide with each other so that you can easily reach out. So the shape, the argument that I'm trying to make here is to shape the work we want, there's a need to learn about social issues, social science theories, social science hypothesis and methods, social science data. And social science has a lot to contribute to this regard. And what I want to do uh, here are a couple of samples of what social science has to contribute. I'm gonna quickly skip over that and go directly to the examples uh, that I want to walk through in today's uh, lecture. So, there are two ways in which computer scientists and social scientists could cooperate in this endeavor. Two principal ways, I would argue. One way is what is sometimes called the context of justification. That the new kinds of data that we have on the web enables to test social theories that we could not test previously, right? So um, imagine you wanted to test whether uh, private people who rent their apartments offline discriminate against ethnicities. This would be a very hard study to do, right? It would be very difficult to 
figure out who are the private people who rank many various ads that you can go at. You need to look at these ads, then you maybe actually have to show up at their uh, doorstep uh, with different subjects in order to find out whether there's this story. Suddenly, there are almost complete traces of these interactions on the web. And we can look at the records of these interactions on Airbnb, for example, and others, and learn whether this uh, whether there's actual discrimination. So this is the idea that with digital traces of human social behavior, we suddenly have a much broader space to test social uh, theories and uh, hypotheses. That's the context of justification. Given a theory, and we didn't have data, but now with the work we have, can we test it? And then there's also the context of discovery, uh, which is a slightly complementary problem which is a complementary problem, which is the idea that given social data, can we um, create new theories from data? Okay, so the induction. In this tutorial, we are going to focus on the context of justification mostly. Uh, and what I'm going, uh, what I'm trying to do in the next uh, 50 minutes or so is give you an idea of a couple of, um, a couple of sociological theories that can be used to infer hypotheses through operationalization, which then can be tested with web data. So that's sort of the scientific process that I'm here, uh, that I want to look at, right? Given a theory that can be uh, operationalized as hypothesis, and given web data on which we can test this hypothesis, what can we learn about this hypothesis? In order to get from sociological theory to hypothesis, we operationalize uh, theories. In order to get from hypothesis uh, to data, we need to look at methods. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is sort of an, an iterative uh, cycle. In my tutorial, I will give an overview of, of three main social theories that one can use when looking at the web. And Claudia, who will be here after the lunch break, will talk about the methods uh, that you can apply when studying um, social theories. So that's sort of the framework of the tutorial. Uh, that's how we think about it. I don't know if you've followed this discussion, but with the advent of the web and big data, there has been a controversy on the role of theory. Um, and the question that arises is, if we have all this data, do we need theory at all? Or can we just come up with hypotheses, test them on data, and be fine? So what is the reason, or what are possible reasons, why we should still be interested in theory? Or, let, let, it, let me phrase it differently, are there reasons to abolish theory and just go with data and hypothesis testing? Which, you know, which would be a completely different approach to uh, understanding the world. Yeah? Even like computer science theory, you know, the massive data sets, they are inducted by the select procedures. In order to you know, navigate this stuff, social technology has a role to, you know, sorting out the what features is important and what is not important. So I think social technology has that's, I think that's already an excellent answer. There is an inherent bias, of course, of course, in data, and without theory, it would be hard, for example, to account for these biases. Are there other answers? Yes? There's lots of different ways to design data studies. So theory can give a sense of, like, appropriate ways to design them or different directions. Okay, that, that would be theories with regard to methodology. Is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, like, so or is this sociological theory? Yes, so okay. you can, I mean, you can design data to look like different things, right? So theory can, um, sure. you can use theory to help make decisions about, like, Okay, now, now let me play devil's advocate. As somebody who would, who, let's say, I'm somebody who believes in there is no role for theory, just for the sake of the argument. Wouldn't I say then that there is no need to design data? Wouldn't I say that this data has not been designed, it's what we have, and there is no need to design it. We just take whatever we see, right? If, for example, 
we are interested in Facebook. We don't, if you are in Facebook, you, there's no need to design the data. All you need to do is take all of the data and run your hypothesis. So then I would not need any theory. Right. But then you would miss things, like, then you would miss things like the time, for example. Like right, so if you only took the data from Facebook and just looked at that, you would, you would have missed the fact that people didn't put the beer bottles in the garbage because they had the fun. Right? So you have to take into account this other. You can't just go pure. All right, but is that a theory or is that just background knowledge about the world? Yeah, but it's a theory to say that there are other things that are in Right. Uh, but again, that would be a, a theory sort of um, regarding methodology, but probably not a sociological theory. Would be the answer probably. Yeah, but <coughs> is it why to look at theory? Maybe because of property rights? Uh, because if I say something, I don't know, wait, some author said the same uh, 20 years ago, 100 years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm, maybe that those are sort of sociological explanations, and they certainly play a role, I would say. What I'm trying to get at a bit is sort of epistemological answers to that question. What is the role of theory in science in the first place? So we have masses of data, and uh, you can pick up that data at a different time, for which perspective to see it. <coughs> and uh, you, you need semantic, you need the meaning of the data, and the theory gives it to that. All right, yeah. I would even, yeah. Maybe it's a comes of the question itself. So, I mean, you have this data, and you can answer it as well, yeah. To generate questions? Yeah. Outside. Pardon? Outside. 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 I guess that is one of the main reasons. Because we want to answer right questions. Because we want to understand how the world works. And theories explain that, right? They might be wrong. But they still provide an answer to my questions. So we need to, these theories because they have to they have explanatory power. We can generate questions from theory and uh, we can answer questions from theory. So even in the presence of big data, I think it would be harmful to abolish theory and not uh, look at uh, the broad body of theories that, we, uh, that, for example, the social and sociological sciences have come up with. And because of that, I want to give you uh, examples of three theories that I want to go through uh, in the rest of the tutorial, just to give you an idea of uh, what are prominent examples in the social sciences uh, with regarding to uh, human social these are uh, some of the learning goals that we have for this uh, tutorial. I hope that at the end of this tutorial, of my talk and of Claudia's talk, you are able to understand the web as a membrane for social issues, where social issues spill over from the offline to the online world. I hope you understand the web's research potential and limitations from a social science perspective, the role of theory in social science, also how sociological theories can be operationalized, 
I want, we want to give you an overview of the different methods, uh, and maybe also give you an overview of the instance. Okay. Let me skip that and jump right to the theories that I want to talk to. And the theories that I want to talk to are three theories. And I've, I just learned that implicitly you've already heard about the first theory uh, during this week from a no shear contractor who has uh, talked about a game that is based on the idea of the small world hypothesis, on the ability of people to find short paths to other people in a given network. And what I want to uh, talk about in the, in the first part of the remainder is give you an idea of the history of this theory. Where, where does this idea come from? In the second part, I want to talk about social ties and theories related to social ties. And in the third part, I want to talk about uh, the social brain theory, the idea that there is a cognitive limit to your capacity to engage in meaningful inter social interactions with other people. First hypothesis is Stanley Milgram, second hypothesis is Mark Granovetter, and third one is Robin Dunbar, uh, proposed by those people. How many of you have heard about Milgram? Okay. And how many of you know about the experiment with stockbrokers? That's a few, okay. How many of you have heard about, uh, from Mark Granvetta? Okay, you. Robin Dunbar? Perfect. So let's go through that um, and start off with the small world hypothesis. The small world hypothesis is interested in the idea of how connected societies are. And it essentially uh, reflects a so a common sense intuition about uh, the world. Let's say we select any person from the 1.5 billion inhabitants of the Earth. This intuition says that using no more than five individuals, one of whom is a personal acquaintance, a, target, a start person could contact a target person using nothing except the network of personal acquaintances. So the idea was formulated by uh, Stanley Milgram. And more formally, uh, he says that given any two people in the world, let's call these people X and Y, how many intermediate acquaintances link between X and Y? So how many hops is every one of you away from every other person in the world? That's the intuition. And the small world hypothesis postulates that it's a very small number. Maybe six, which is astonishing given a world of seven million people. And uh, this was a problem that Stanley Milgram was already interested in in uh, 1969. And of course, there was no web at this time, right? So, how do you approach uh, this question not having digital traces of social networks and social interactions? The way that you do yourself. Maybe those of you who have not heard about uh, the Milgram experiment yet, how would you approach this question if you were a sociologist in the 1960s interested, interested in testing the question of six degrees of separation? What would you do? Pardon? Yes. And that's what Milgram did, exactly. Um, what Milgram did was he selected a couple of, uh, no, it was just one target person, a stockbroker in Boston. And he identified a couple of, he called this person the target person. This was the person that others had to find. And then he came up with uh, three uh, starting groups. One group, I think, let's see whether I have the, uh, the, the, the actual setup here. Yes, uh, 100 random people who were from the same city, Boston. 
96 random people in Nebraska, which was kind of far removed from Boston. And then 100 stockholders in Nebraska, where the idea was that maybe stockholders find shorter path because they sort of had a deeper understanding of, about the profession that the target was. And what he did was he asked the target, uh, the starting uh, individuals, to take a document. He provided them with a document with information about the target person including name, address, occupation, company, and hometown, and asked them, delivered this document to the starting person, and asked them to mark it with their name, deliver it to the target, if it's a personal acquaintance directly. So it was not allowed to simply send this document to the target person via mail, right? That would not make sense in this setup. And so the idea was to deliver it through a chain of acquaintances, a chain of friends that would uh, each bring the letter closer to the target, right? Either geographically or socially or whatever. But the idea is that uh, the starting person sits there, has this letter in the hand, thinks about the stockbroker, and maybe in their own social network has a friend who has worked in Boston for two years. Maybe that is the right person to forward this letter to, right? Or maybe he knows uh, another stockbroker, and maybe uh, he thinks or she thinks that moving that letter to the stockbroker would move it closer to the stockbroker in Boston. Um, and then there was this idea to send a special tracer card to the university so that we, not only, we would not only have the letter and how it moves, but we would also have a record of who this letter was sent. And this is the result. Um, on the right, uh, on the horizontal axis, we see the number of acquaintances. And on the uh, y-axis, we, we see the number of chains that have found a target with that number, with that length of the chain. Okay? So what are things that you can see here? What we can see is two interesting things. First of all, there seems to be a large number of chains between three and seven, roughly, that have completed. That's interesting, right? Uh, it seems like six degrees of separation is, is not exactly an upper bound. There are chains that, that take longer than that. But many of the chains that have completed are within that bound. Does that say that the theory is correct? What are prob what's problematic with that reason? Very small n. Very small n in terms of subjects or in terms of completions? Uh, in terms of, I mean, you're only talking about one person. Uh, that I'm trying to say. Uh, okay, so that is a problem. Uh, Even the 300 starting people could yeah. be a problem. But there are more problems, right? Only 64 chains reach the target out of 300. What's with the other 240? What happened to them? They did not find the target, but why? Many reasons, right? Uh, we don't know. It could, it could be that um, they lost motivation to play the game. It could be there was no way to find the target. Uh, so it's very hard to say uh, what the actual reason is. Um, there are chains that finish uh, of lengths 11, right? What does that tell us? Does that tell us that some people are disconnected by a chain of length 7? Probably not, right? It, it, maybe there is a shorter, uh, a, a shorter link between those two people. And the people in the chain were just not able to find it. Um, but maybe it is. Maybe this is actually uh, the, the shortest uh, path lengths that we can find. So there are many open questions uh, related to this experiment. Here's the, uh, an analysis of the dropouts, the, the people who did not finish uh, the chain. And what we see is that uh, it seems like after uh, four or five full body letters, already a large share of the people gave up. Uh, we don't know why they gave up, 
but we see that sort of uh, there's yeah. I have a theory. No, I can, just because I send it to a friend, you send it to a friend, and they don't want to care about me. They're my friend's friend, you know, like so. It's not. It's not. You know. Yes, that could be one explanation. That's theory. <laughs> I would say this is a hypothesis. Yeah. That's not a theory. Right? The theory is sort of a more complex argument of, uh, of concepts. Yeah. But it's testable. Uh, so and there are some, and I just discussed a couple of these problems with validity. For example, uh, ecological validity, the experiment was well laid out. It was sort of a very natural setting. Um, with regard to reliability, uh, we might wonder why 80% of the chains are discarded. As we have discussed, that might be a problem. External validity, that was the issue that we've just discussed. discussed there's just one special target person, and maybe this person is really special, right? It was certainly a high-status person, a stockbroker in Boston, who can be assumed to maybe have a wider social network or be more known than other people. And there was a certain bias in the starting population. Okay. So that's a classical social science experiment, I would say. What does that have to do with computational social science? And uh, of course, when we look at the world today, let's move 50 years into the future uh, and we arrive uh, today. The world is completely different and we have completely different ways of studying this question, right? completely different ways of exploring how connected societies are. So, and uh, what, what there are two examples of uh, more modern studies of this uh, problem. Uh, let me skip that and move on directly to this um, topological small world study done by Leskovets and Microsoft Research where they looked at Microsoft Network Messenger data. This is something like a uh, chat client that people can install. How many of you use Microsoft Network Messenger? Existent. Okay, pardon? Existent. A, a, a few people raised their hands. Does it exist? No, I not anymore. Okay, you've used it. But at one point it was highly popular, apparently. Uh, they have a data set of 180 million users. Imagine the difference between a study of 300 people in, of, in the US population and a data set of 180 people spanning the entire And that's what they did here. 180 million nodes, 1.3 billion undirected edges. And they calculated the topological distance between 100 random nodes and all others because of computational complexity. It's not actually that easy to calculate short, all paths, shortest path of a graph with 180 million nodes. And what they found was uh, in this huge network, the mode was 6, median was 7, average was 6.6. .6. That's quite interesting, isn't it? It's surprisingly close to this common sense intuition that we are all uh, six degrees of separation apart from each other. Yet what is the problem with this uh, analysis? What is different between the analysis uh, that we see here, a large social network graph, 100 million nodes, and we calculate the shortest path between those nodes, and the experiment that Wilbur has set up? What are the fundamental differences? So is, does, if we find on average, uh, six hops in the Milgram experiment, and on average, 6.6 uh, hop distance in the Microsoft experiment. Is that equivalent? Is, is, what are the differences in the experiment itself? Yes? So they try to this one and test how to add algorithm by looking at the data set. But the Milgram study is actually passing by the package, right? So the difference that you are, I think, alluding to is the ability to find the shortest path, right? Whereas in the MSN data, we assume that people would find it. We just calculate it based on the... Uh, I also have to explain, I think, what the links in the MSN data are. I think it's messages, uh, communication sent from A to B creates a link between A and B. That doesn't mean that they are trying to find a target, right? 
It just means that they have communicated with each other, and they might not approach this person if they need to forward a letter to another child. They might be much more inefficient in finding short path than what we might estimate from looking at the thing. Any other thoughts on? Yeah, and also they, uh, over here, perhaps. Also, even though you have all of these connections. So that's the problem with missing data in networks, right? The network representation that we have from MSN might be missing links that exist in the real world. Any other thoughts? All right. Uh, there's another example of doing that study on Facebook with 700 million nodes, 70 billion edges. There's an average of 4.7 or 4.5 ops, which is short. But again, it was I think here it was uh, done on Facebook friend relationships, and many of the uh, things that you just mentioned for the MSN graph certainly applies to the Facebook data as well. Same uh, limitations. But still, we would. The limitations should not prevent us from being interested in the data, right? Just because there are differences in the setup doesn't mean that those studies are worthless. That's a point that I want to highlight, right? There's an opportunity to now suddenly study, in this case, 700 million nodes. That's unprecedented. And even if we don't have the exact setup and the same exact question that we had in the Milgram experiment, I would argue that there is still something to learn from it, right? There's still something to learn about how friendship is uh, maybe represented on an online social network and how connected we are through the web in such an environment. There's still value in doing that. We just need to be aware of the differences in the different settings. These are a couple of the things that uh, we've discussed. Um, are social network ties good proxies for acquaintance relationships, external mobility, for example, custom is not generalized across platforms. Just because we found it on Facebook, would that mean that we observe something similar on another platform? There is the theory uh, of networks that as they grow, their average shortest path rings. Is this also true as more and more people join Facebook or join these online social networks? We don't know. Construct validity is the results in line with our expectations. What should we compare it to? And ecological validity, of course. What does this graph distance mean that we observe uh, here in these studies? And that brings us uh, to the second theory that I want to talk to, which is uh, a theory of ties. Things. Because ties are so essential in sociology, right? Because if you think about it, there is no social science without any kind of social relationships. So the tie is one of the most fundamental concepts uh, when we are interested in social networks. And uh, when we reflect about a uh, ground a small world experiment, then what we will find is that participants um, have to document whether they have forwarded um, the letter to a remote acquaintance or to a close friend. So whenever they forward the letter, they had to make the judgment whether the next person is a close friend or a remote acquaintance. And when Milgram looked at the chains that completed, he found out that the completion rate was 26% more likely if the first uh, tie was an acquaintance rather uh, than a friend. And that is all, right? It seems like if you, it seems like you know your close friends better than your remote friends. And you would rely more on your close friends to forward those letters than you would rely on your remote friends, right? That would be sort of a plausible assumption. Yet it turns out that in the data the opposite is true. It turns out that in the data 
uh, acquaintances, remote friends, play a much more critical role in completion than close friends. And why is that? Uh, well, it's just you know who your friends know, so you know not to, like, if I know that you know this stuff, then I would just send it to them. Okay. But I think the actual, the crucial test would be, uh, I think, uh, whether That's a friend, a good answer. Yeah, but whether the friend, whether a friend or an acquaintance is more likely to send it at all. That's the right question. Yes, maybe so a psychological uh, component that comes to the Yes. Yeah. So, um, this sparked the discussion whether weak ties are more effective to exchange information than strong ties. Maybe the weak ties, the weak relationships that you have in your life, actually are more critical for the connectedness of the society than the strong ties that you have. And Granovetta got interested in this idea. Um, and looked at the degree of overlap of two individual uh, friendships uh, and found that it varies directly with the strengths of their social ties. So the strength of the tie is proportional to the similarity of its endpoints. And that is, I think, the explanation that was just given before, right? The idea that if you have a strong tie with a close friend, there is a higher probability that you also share a larger part of your social life. Let's take the most extreme case. Let's say you have a friendship in which you spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with each other. If you had this friendship, you would probably, after a certain amount of time, you would have probably uh, a very similar social life. Because the two of you are always in the same place. And whenever A talks to somebody, then B is right next to it and can participate. So in the most extreme case, uh, a, a, a very strong tie would expose the two people to the exact same social network. And the more time you spend with another person, the higher the probability that you actually run into the same people. So there's a, a sort of a relational explanation now why the weak ties, maybe, are useful for this task, because they help you to reach parts of the social network that your close friends cannot reach, because your close friends know, by and large, the same people that you do. Um, but how do you measure the strength of the tie? How do you exactly break it down and operationalize it? And uh, there is uh, one study that was... so. In, what Gunnarvetta proposed was the strength of the tie is a combination of all these things. It's amount of time, emotional intensity, intimacy, reciprocity, and other things. And uh, in a paper um, that was published in 2009, uh, what Eric uh, Gilbert and others have done was they looked at Facebook relationships and they have asked people to rate their Facebook relationships and to score the st strength of the tie, right? So the idea is that a researcher approaches you, asks you to go to your Facebook account, pick a sample of users that you have in your friend list, and ask for each of them how, how strong is your tie to this person. And the idea is that maybe uh, to your inner family, you give higher ratings, higher scores, than to a high school friend from 20 years ago. So people rate these score their relationships. And then what they did was they looked at different attributes that Facebook has about yourself and your friends, and then tried to find those attributes that correlate, correlate higher, so I think the strength of the relationship. And what, this is what they found. They found that intimacy, as measured as last communication, number of friends, or intimacy words is most indicative of tie strength, right? So, in other words, the person that you've last communicated with on Facebook is already an, indi is already an indicator for the kind of relationship that you have with them, statistically, right? Intensity, how often you exchange messages on Facebook with each other. Um, Threat of depth, 
How deep are the conversations in which, by which you engage with these people? Duration. Uh, how long do conversations uh, drag on? Social distance, as measured as, for example, educational distance, political or occupational distance, still explain part of the scores that people assign when they try to uh, assess us. So if we have the question of uh, on in online social media of what is indicative of Thai strength, this gives us the first answer. And uh, that relates back to Ganometa uh, theory, which is the stronger the tie between A and B, the more the high, the more similar they are, and the higher the number of their shared social contacts. And this gets us to the forbidden drive. This gets us to the idea of Granometer that if A and B have a strong tie with each other, and if A also has a strong tie with C, then there must be a, a tie between C and B. Why? So if A and B share a strong tie, and if A and C share a strong tie, then why must C and B also share a strong tie? Yes? A uh, friend of my friend is my friend. But why? So that's sort of a, a proverbial explanation, I would say. But, but why is it? How, how do we know that a friend of a friend is also my friend? So common what? Yes, but I think there's an even stronger, maybe theoretical explanation given on what we've just discussed. You can be to build pressure on the same things. Sure, but maybe not. Right? Yes, that we like it to have met and A spent a lot of time with exactly. and B, exactly. then B and C will have to have Exactly. Each other. So if A and B spend lots of time with each other, and for the sake of argument, let's say they spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week with each other. And A and, B, uh, and A and C spend a lot of time with each other, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Then C and B must know each other. There is no way out, right? If they all spend time with each other, A with B and A with C, then C and B must know each other. So that's sort of the theoretical argument taken the argument to extreme. But the idea is that if two people have a really strong bond with each other, a very strong tie, and this person has another strong tie with another person, then these two people must know each other because they are at the same place at some point in time. And that's what Granovetter has called the forbidden tribe. He says that if A has a strong tie with B, and if A has a strong tie with C, then there must be an ex a situation cannot exist where C does not also have a strong tie with <laughs> yeah, the wife is a good example, right? Yeah, uh -huh. aha. Ah, this, this is a good counter example. But eventually, maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, I would argue that maybe uh, it's, a good, it's a nice example. Uh, but then maybe this tie was not that strong in the first place. Right? Uh, because obviously, the wife tries to take out some time out of the time that she would spend with the husband to meet with others and even actively. But it's a good counter example, I would say. Okay, so, uh, so that's the theory, right? And that's what we uh, are interested in in this context, in sociological theory. Now let's try to think about whether we can operationalize that theory so that we can test it. And one hypothesis that we could come up with is the following that directly follows from this theory. Let's say we want to predict the formation of edges on the web. Let's say we want to predict whether two nodes that we pick at random will uh, have an edge at some point in the future. Then this theory would say that the more triangles the edge closes, the higher the likelihood of its formation. 
right? Because if we assume strong ties, then we would assume that uh, the forbidden triad holds and we must close these ties. So when A knows B and C knows B, uh, when A knows B and A knows C, then B and C must know each other as well. And that's sometimes called the principle of closing triads, right? If there are already two links in a triangle, then the third link will pop up sometime in the future. That follows from this theory of kind. And we can operationalize it and test it on data. So if we look at this example, if we have A, B, and C, and if we look at uh, the relationship between A and B, which do not have a direct link, but there are lots of nodes that already connect A and B, then we would say that, if we believe in this theory, that A and B have a higher likelihood of creating an edge than A and C where there's just one joint. Wait, that would be one implication of this theory. And this can be tested, right? We can actually look at networks over time and see whether our two hop neighbors form edges as predicted by theory. And it turns out, when we look at networks over time, that this is really highly predicted. And this is one of the examples why theory makes sense, right? Let's, when you think about the forbidden triad, there's no data in, in this slide. There's, it's just an idea about how the world works, right? It's an explanation of how we form relationships. And we can operationalize this idea. We can even deduce hypotheses that we can actually then apply the data to test it. And once we do that, we can look at the world, get the results, and the advantage of the theory now is that we can interpret and explain these results. Right? In the absence of theory, we could count triangles and closing triangles in a data set, but we would not have any way of explaining why those triangles close. It's the sociological theory that helps us in interpreting and explaining such results that are fairly easy to compute, but that need theory to interpret. We need theory to understand what the mechanisms are. That are so here, let's just go through the example that we had. We have the theory that strengths, high strengths means time and intimacy. Then we can come up with a hypothesis that people who declare to the close friends spend more time together and exchange more emotion words. And then you can actually go and test this hypothesis. And that's what this uh, cycle that I showed at the beginning refers to, right? From sociological theory through operationalization to uh, hypothesis. And from hypothesis through the application of methods, in this case, it's social network method measures like uh, triangles and counting of triadic closure, that we can actually go from theory to facts and back to theory and learn something about the value of theory. Um, there's another interesting side um, implication of this, of this finding that weak ties help in information in the future. So some of you might be familiar with the notion of a tie, uh, of a bridge in networks, which is the idea that an edge between two nodes is a bridge if it connects two other two components in the network that would otherwise not be connected. So an, an edge is a bridge if it uniquely or more or less uniquely connects two parts of the network that would otherwise be not connected or, or connected only through a high number of uh, links. And here's an example of that, right? We would say that uh, the edge between A and B is a local bridge of high degree if severing that edge would increase the connectivity between A and B by lots of hops, right? A and B, in this example, would still be connected if we severe this edge. 
but the connectivity would, would be much worse, right? Here we would have a distance of 1, and if we severe this i, it might be a distance of 15. So the stronger a bridge is, the more important an edge is to the connectivity of the network. The key thing here now is that if we have a bridge that is important, by definition, it has to be a weak type. Why? Why? Yeah. Because otherwise the network around the internet would be closer and it wouldn't be, the bridge would be a part of the network. So, because right. So, so if we would severe a strong tie, it would not drastically increase the connectivity of the two nodes that are participating in this why? Because they have many common acquaintances that then connect them not through a, a distance one, but distance two maybe. Right? Only if it's a weak die, an edge can be a strong bridge. That's interesting, isn't it? So if you want to explore your social network, let's say you are on the job market at some point, and you want to reach out to different areas of your social network. What follows from this study was, and this was actually the motivation for the study, that you should rather reach into your weak ties than your strong ties. Why? I think the answer is clear. Right? Yes. Or in other words, Uh, okay, let's go back. So if you say that bridge is a weak time, how come a weak time is a, is a method actually breaking the bridge time to create a reduced path length? Can you say that again? If you say that a bridge is a weak time, yeah. it will not necessarily have to create it to create a reduced path length, right? You have to maintain it. Yes. But if I break it, the connectivity of the two nodes would drastically suffer. Yeah, because you have a much longer path. Exactly. And several exactly. Paths. And that's what we refer to as a strong bridge, or a bridge, a local bridge of high degree. And only weak ties can be strong bridges. A or a, only weak ties can be local bridges of high degree. A strong tie cannot be a local bridge of high degree because if we would severe a strong tie, there would be many other ways in which those two would be, nodes would be connected through short distances because they share so many common acquaintances. Does that answer the question? Okay. So, for example, if you're in a job market, strong ties do not help you in your job search because they all know who you already know, right? More or less, in a simplified manner. So it's worth tapping into those relations that are weak. Why? Because they help you span different parts of the social network that you would otherwise not be able to access. That leads us to the third theory, which is which is related to the question of why the triangle closure process stops. And that's something that we can answer. Um, and in other words, the question is, how big is the ego network, the network sort of, of one hop uh, connections to other people of a given person? So it seems like that when we look at uh, friend relationships in the real world or in social media that at some point uh, the rate at which new connections are created slows down. And uh, one of the theories behind that was produced by Robin Dunbar who uh, proposes or who states that big brains, big human brains evolve to solve the problem of social life. 
So the idea is that we need our, our brain, which is much bigger than uh, from other species, to deal with the complexities of social lives. And uh, when we look at uh, different uh, species, and we plot the size of the neocortex on one axis, and the average size of the social groups of these species on the other axis, then it seems like there is a correlation between the size of the brain and the size of the social groups with which uh, individuals interact. So it seems like uh, monkeys and apes are sort of off the chart, but there are other species, and it seems to follow a very linear uh, correlation. It seems like that as our brain increases, our ability to engage with larger social groups increases. And uh, what we also, uh, what Dunbar also suggested was that there are limits to the number of relations, uh, meaningful relations that you can maintain. And uh, this uh, limit is somewhere between 100 and 200 individuals, uh, and 150 is sort of this anecdotal number uh, which is sometimes called, or often called, uh, referred to as the Dunbar number, which states that sort of 150 people is the amount of people that humans are on average able to keep meaningful relationships with. And uh, again, uh, there was an experiment 14, 15 years ago. That, uh, it was not pre-web, but it was at the beginning of the web. Where the setup was the following, uh, instead of letters, uh, there was a survey where people were asked how many Christmas cards are sent. So there was a questionnaire uh, fielded to UK households, and uh, what they found was that um, on average people sent 100 to 150 uh, postcards, uh, Christmas cards. To each other. This is sort of the, the, the number of cards that are being sent, uh, reported in these households. But again, uh, of course, one can look at social media to study what's the number of people that uh, a human subject can maintain reasonable contact. Here's, uh, I believe, a study from um, so I, let me skip that, uh, but let's go to uh, this study on Twitter. Um, we should have follower and following relationships on Twitter. And uh, it seems like on Twitter this is not true. It seems like uh, there is no limit to the number of uh, people that, the number of people that people follow. And that seems kind of odd. It seems to suggest that maybe in the digital world we have a higher ability to deal with larger groups. It could also mean that maybe our interactions are less meaningful, or maybe you know it doesn't mean anything that you have a thousand Facebook friends, for example. Um, but again, uh, when we ask more subtle questions, like a survey to Facebook users, and when we ask them to rate how many friends they have, how many close friends they have, and how many support members they have, uh, then we get very interesting answers. So, on top of the graph that we have, so those are answers from people, this is not the social network. Right? They still say that maybe uh, they would consider 100 or 200 of their network as actual friends. Um, they would characterize five to ten people as their sympathy group, and maybe one to five as their support group. So the actual numbers for meaningful relationships are much smaller than what a follower relationship on Twitter or a friendship relationship on Facebook graph would suggest. This suggests that there's a strong difference in the quality of these relationships when we look at it. Right? But again, we have a theory embedded here in these analyses, right? All of these studies were informed by theory that maybe there is a cognitive limit to the capacity of people to interact with them. And of course, this is not an absolute limit. It's not that everyone breaks down after he has sort of meaningful relationships with 150. It's a distribution 
uh, where some people are on one side of the spectrum, other people are on the other side of the spectrum. But it seems like when we ask those questions, somewhere between 100 and 200 seems uh, approximately a number that uh, uh, can be observed. When you look at Twitter, not at follower relationships, but the number of interactions between team, two people, uh, I think as measured based on maybe retweets or likes or something like that, the picture changes uh, drastically again. Then we suddenly don't see this unbounded behavior, but again we see something uh, in the range of 100 to 200 people where you can actually engage with. Uh, the same is true for uh, emails. Here's an email corpus, and we actually look at the transactions uh, that uh, the emails that people send to each other. And again, in email networks, we see that uh, there is an uptick right around, in this case, 150 and 250, which is, again, surprisingly close to this idea that uh, Robin Van has put OK, I'm running out of time, so uh, this is already one of my uh, summarizing slides. <laughs> what I wanted to achieve in this first part of the tutorial is two things, I would say. The first thing is, to give you an answer why to do web science. And I hope that through the range of examples that I've shown you uh, and through the discussion that we had, I hope that uh, it's clear now that web science is sort of an obligation that we have as a society. We need to uh, concern ourselves with these questions. Somebody needs to. And I think the web science community and you as uh, potentially future web scientists are really uniquely in position because you have an interdisciplinary network, you have interdisciplinary interests, and it needs, it needs people like you to tackle these questions. In the second part, I was trying to give you an idea of why in the light of big data there is still a benefit for theory. And I've walked you through three exemplary theories, uh, Granovetta, Milgram, and Dunbar, that show, I think, that nicely illustrates sort of a prototypical uh, approach maybe to studying social phenomena via web-based approaches. In each of these examples, we had sort of offline observations and offline ideas about how people interact with each other. And then, through operationalization and through mostly network-based measures, we were able to test parts of these theories on actual data, and then I learned something potentially about the world and about the thief. And just counting triangles, for example, would not tell us anything about how people work. It's only that counting triangles together with the strengths of weak ties and maybe uh, the idea uh, of a small worlds helps us to gain a deeper understanding of how people relate to each other and how people uh, function in large groups. That's the end of my part. Uh, there's going to be a break now. Uh, you know the deal I was told. Um, in the second half, Claudia uh, Wagner will uh, talk about methods. How to get uh, from methods to uh, empirical studies. And she will give you an overview of different methods, also talking about causality. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank uh, every one of you for your interest and your uh, attention. Chef asked me to uh, shorten the break a bit so that we catch up in the schedule because maybe some of you might have to leave in the afternoon. So I would like to ask you to be back at 1.15. Uh, enjoy your lunch.